Mount Zion Church, we are studying the Word of God. I'm so glad that you have joined us. We are reading through the book of 2 Corinthians, verse by verse, asking God to speak to our hearts. We get strong in the Word of God, and that's why we go to Him again and again, that He would teach us how to live our lives well, that He would speak to us of His goodness, that He would speak to us of of the life that he calls us to live. So we're going to pray, and then we'll get started. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for this privilege, Lord God, that as we go to your word, you give us strength. Lord, you speak truths into our hearts and our minds, Lord God, and we ask, Lord, that you would fill us now here with your Holy Spirit, that you would teach us as we hear and as we read, as we consider uh, your word. Lord, we lift up our lives to you. We ask, Father, that you would give us that strength, give us that wisdom, give us that courage. Uh, Give us, Lord, all that we need to follow after Jesus. We love you, and we thank you, and we pray these things in his precious name. Amen and amen. So we are reading this this letter that that man named Paul wrote to a congregation of Christians in the city of Corinth that was in the nation of Greece in the Roman Empire. Paul was the first person to go to Corinth talking about Jesus, lifting up this good news. So this is he, he came to Corinth just, you know, a couple decades after Jesus walked uh, the face of this earth, at not even a couple decades, uh, and he was lifting up the name of Jesus, a congregation formed. Paul stayed there for about two years pastoring that congregation. Now, Paul knew the calling on his life was to go from place to place to establish congregations in, in cities and towns everywhere he could. And that's what he did. But in Corinth, he stayed there for a couple of years because he knew the strategic importance of that city of Corinth. It was like a a gateway to a whole region. And many people would come to the city of Corinth for business, for trade. And so if the church was well established in Corinth, they would be able to be sharing Jesus with a whole lot of people who would be going back to their homes in various cities and towns. So Paul invested two years uh, of time Uh, in Corinth, and this letter now is written later as he has gone on now to other places, and he is ministering from place to place, and he receives word back that things aren't going well in the congregation, and the biggest problem was there was someone who had come to the congregation, uh, as Jesus said, a false prophet, a false teacher, Jesus said these false prophets are wolves in sheep's clothing. They clothe themselves as if they were one of Jesus' sheep. He's our good shepherd. Uh, We are his sheep. So these false prophets, false teachers, give the appearance, right, that they are a follower of Jesus. But Jesus said that they are ravenous wolves. They they come, right, for their own purposes, and greed, uh, Jesus identified those two purposes over and over again as greed and lust. And so someone has come, Paul hears word that someone has come to this congregation in Corinth, and he's there saying a whole lot that is not true. And the deal is that there are some of the people in the church in Corinth who have kind of been sucked into to this guy. Now, he's there for his own purposes. He's, he's a ravenous wolf in sheep's clothing. Right? Some persons in the congregation have kind of been sucked into, his, uh, into following after him and uh, being influenced by him. Paul's big concern is that the rest of the congregation is just putting up with this. They're not standing up against what this man is saying, what this man is doing. They're allowing this to go on. And so Paul's concern is, as you allow this to go on, more and more persons are going to fall away from Jesus. Even though, even though this, this false teacher, this false prophet was speaking in the name of Jesus, talking about Jesus, he was doing so for his own purposes, and he's twisting the message. He's, you know, you can twist the scriptures very easily, very easily. Do you remember when Jesus was tempted by the devil? And the devil quotes scripture to try to tempt Jesus. The devil quotes scripture, twisting the meaning of it. William Shakespeare said the devil quotes scripture for his own purposes. And so that's what this false 
prophet, this false teacher in the church in Corinth was doing. And in all kinds of ways, he was doing that. And one of the biggest things that Paul is concerned about is that this teacher is saying, look, if you have the kind of faith that I have, look at my life, he said. Look how wonderful, look look how perfect, look how awesome my life is. If you have the kind of faith in Jesus that I have, your life will be awesome and perfect and wonderful. And then this false prophet who knew that a lot of the people, you know, they had come to Jesus through Paul. And, and, you know, they still thought highly of Paul and of the teaching, the scripture that he had brought to them. And so this man started to say, now look at that Paul. You think he's such a man of God, but look at all the problems that he has in his life. If he were a real man of God, if he had real faith in Jesus, he wouldn't have all those problems. And so Paul knows If the people begin more and more to believe that, they will fall away from Jesus. They'll lose their faith in Jesus. Because Jesus said, you will have, in this life, you will have tribulation, huge problems, huge trouble. And if you believe, no, I won't. If I have real faith in Jesus, I won't have huge problems, huge trouble. Then when it comes, you'll say to yourself, I guess this Jesus thing isn't real. So Paul spends a whole lot of time addressing that. And you know, when you're reading the Bible and you see that the Bible talks about some particular topic a lot, that's God saying to you and me, pay attention. Pay attention. Why do we have this very long letter with a whole lot of it all about this one topic? Because our God knows it wasn't just somebody doing that in that one congregation. This will be repeated over and over and over again. God knew it in history. There would be false prophets. There would be wolves in sheep's clothing coming to the church, coming to God's people, acting as if they're followers of Jesus, but preaching the same message. If you have faith in Jesus, if you really know how to pray, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, you won't have these big problems. You can have, you know, your wonderful, perfect life. Everything will be great. And of course, they don't say it in quite those words. They're slick, right? Very slick. Read about the false prophets back in the Old Testament. You know, the true prophets, Jeremiah, Isaiah, Amos, Joel, Hosea, right? Uh, They spoke some hard truths. But the false prophets that you read about, oh, they spoke what everybody wanted to hear. Sure, we want to hear what that false prophet in Corinth was saying. We want to hear what the false prophets today say. Yeah, look, look at me, man. Look at my life. Look how awesome it is. Look how, what a wonderful, carefree, trouble-free life you can have if you know how to put faith in Jesus. And it's false. It's false. So let's pick it up. Paul's going on this exact line here. In this section we're going to read, we're in chapter 12, and we're in verse 1. So let's start right there. I must go on boasting, though there is nothing to be gained by it. I will go on to visions and revelations of the Lord. Now, he's been using this word boasting in this section of the letter. And he says, I must go on boasting. And he means, okay, I'm going to have to tell you about myself. This guy, this false prophet, is telling you all about himself and how his wonderful faith has resulted in a wonderful, no troubles in his life. And this false prophet is saying, look at Paul's life. Look at all the trouble in his life. Apparently, he doesn't have faith or real faith or strong faith in Jesus. So Paul says, all right, if I have to talk about myself, I'm going to do it. He says, though there is nothing to be gained by it. He's saying, "Uh, there's nothing for me to gain by it. Oh, this false guy in your church now? This false prophet? Oh, yeah, he's seeking gain through convincing you that if you have the kind of faith that he has, you won't have any problems. He's seeking to suck people in for his own greedy, lustful purposes. So, he's, so then Paul says, at the end of that verse 1, I will go on to visions and revelations of the Lord. Now, what are visions and revelations? God promises in his word that he gives visions to his people, right? He gives a vision, perhaps, of a way that he's calling you to serve, to serve Jesus. He gives a vision of of uh, a, a way for you to bring the goodness and the kindness of God. He gives visions of spiritual truth, spiritual realities that are beyond our mind and beyond our ability to see with our eyes, right? He gives visions and revelations, revelations. He reveals truths to us that we wouldn't know 
in and of ourselves. He, he reveals truths of that which is to come or truths of, of who our God is, of his working in this world, in our lives. So Paul says, all right, if I have to talk about myself, I'm going to talk about visions and revelations that the Lord gave me. So at verse 2, I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven. Whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. So now he says, I know a man in Christ. So he's talking in third person now, right? He's talking about himself. But by talking, instead of saying, you know, 14 years ago I was caught up, he says, I know a man. He's being forced. We've seen this all along. He keeps saying it. Okay, this situation is forcing me to talk about my own life, right? We saw, right, in, in chapter 11 here, right before this chapter 12, that he talked about all the struggles and the difficulties in his life. This false prophet guy is talking about how great and wonderful and perfect his life is. He's painting a false picture, of course, because everyone has trouble, tribulation in life. And a false prophet, man, he is heading to it big time. Who were Jesus' hardest words always to, to the religious leaders who had become hypocritical, corrupt, liars, wolves in sheep's clothing. So this false prophet in Corinth is talking about himself all the time. So now Paul, he says, you've pushed me into this, but I have to so that you understand what it does mean, what it really means to follow after Jesus. But he's being humble here. He says, I know a man, he means himself, I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven. So what's the third heaven? So Bible scholars have debated and debated this. Here's one thing that we know. The, the scripture uses the word heaven, heavens, heavenly realms, spiritual realms in different ways. So one way we can look at this phrase third heaven, and this is what I believe Paul meant by it. The first heaven, you might say, is the atmosphere around this globe, the air, right? The atmosphere around this globe. The second heaven would be where the moon, the stars, the planets are, the universe beyond the atmosphere that surrounds this earth. And the third heaven would be what we often call heaven, and the scripture often calls heaven, the dwelling place of God beyond this universe, beyond this universe, heaven. So here Paul says, I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago, he means himself, was caught up into the third heaven. He says, I was taken up to heaven, to the, to the dwelling place of God, beyond the, the air above us, beyond the, the universe, the stars, the planets. I was taken beyond the universe to heaven itself. He says, this was a, a vision, a revelation that I experienced. And then he says, whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. He says, and I don't know if I was taken there bodily or my spirit was taken there up out of my body. He says, I don't know, God knows, but what I know is I was taken there. And so at verse three, and I know that this man was caught up into paradise, whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. He says, and I, I know that this man, again, meaning himself, was caught up into paradise. So what does he mean there? Do you remember when Jesus was dying on the cross? And you remember he was hung on a cross, crucified there. There were two other persons being crucified at the same time, uh, one to his left, one to his, his right. And you remember that as the crowd was still mocking and ridiculing Jesus, these two thieves were also mocking, ridiculing Jesus. But then the thief, as the hours went on, and they're all three of them are hanging on these crosses, slowly dying, the, the one to the, the right of Jesus, his heart, you know, changed. And... He, in fact, he ends up telling the other one, stop, what are you doing yelling at him? What are you doing yelling at him? And then this one, to Jesus' right, looks to Jesus and says, remember me. Remember me in your kingdom. And what did Jesus say to him? He says, truly, I tell you, this day you will be with me in paradise. Paradise, in the presence of Jesus. That's what paradise, we sometimes say, you know, a tropical island is paradise. What paradise is, is being in the presence of Jesus, seeing Jesus with your eyes. In other words, you know, you look somebody in the eyes, you see into their heart, right? Now, 
seeing Jesus, seeing the infinitely powerful, perfect, pure love of Jesus, seeing, experiencing face to face how loved you are by Jesus. That's paradise. That's paradise. We have to do that by faith right now. Right? That's why we come to worship together again and again, because when we're all singing here together, it helps us to have faith that, yes, we are so amazingly loved by Jesus. We get, you might say, a little taste of paradise, a little taste of heaven. You know, when we come together and we're just caught up in singing his praise, we're caught up in praying together as a whole large group of people. And so here's Paul now saying, yeah, I, I was caught up to the third heaven. I was caught up to paradise. I was caught up. And again, he says, whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. All I know is I was in the presence of God, in the presence of Jesus. At verse 4, and he heard things that cannot be told, which man may not utter. And Paul says, and I heard things. He doesn't say, did I hear God himself speak? Did I hear the Father? Did I hear Jesus speak? Did he hear the angels speaking to God? He, he, he doesn't tell us, but he said, I heard things that men may not utter. You know how sometimes the Lord tells you something, right? I know sometimes the Lord has spoken something to my heart that I was not to tell other persons. And so Paul said, and I experienced in this vision, in this revelation, this experience that I had, I heard things that I knew I was not to tell other persons. And so at verse 5, on behalf of this man, I will boast. But on my own behalf, I will not boast except of my weaknesses. <laughs> this all of a sudden seems to come, wait a minute, what's he talking about? So at the beginning of there, verse 5, on behalf of this man, I will boast. So he's saying, look, I'm not telling you all this to tell you, how, look, how wonderful spiritual I am because look at this amazing experience in God that I had. Look at this. I want to tell you about this amazing vision that I had. You know, I keep saying as we during this study that reading these letters is like listening to one end of a phone call. We don't know exactly what Paul was hearing that was going on in the church in Corinth, but we can kind of put it together by reading what Paul wrote in response to it. And so one of the things that we can put together as we're reading this is that that false teacher was talking all the time about visions and revelations that he had, right? And if you read back through the, the Old Testament scriptures where uh, the true prophets were confronting the false prophets, what, what did they say? Uh, they said, look, all you ever do is tell us about your visions, your revelations, right? And, and so here's this Here's Paul saying, all right, I had this experience, but you know what? I'm not here to, I'm not, the reason I'm telling you this is not to tell you how spiritual I am because I had this, this experience of being caught up into heaven. He says, uh, I'm not going to, to boast about that. He says, but on my own behalf, the second half of that verse five, but on my own behalf, I, I will not boast except of my weakness. And here he comes again. He says, now look, what I'm telling you is, even though I had this awesome experience, even though I had this awesome experience, what I want to tell you about is my challenges, my struggles. That's what I want to tell you about. That's what you need to hear about. You know, I realized a long time ago as a preacher, if I'm just you, saying all these awesome things and I never get honest about how hard life is for me, how challenging it is to follow Jesus, the struggles that we have in this world, that this is not easy at all. If I never get honest about that, who would bother to listen? Unless I become slick like the false prophets and just paint this incredible false picture. Oh yeah, you can suck a whole lot of people in that way. But if you want to draw people to Jesus, then yeah, boast about means talk about your own struggles, your own challenges. And that's what Paul says all right, let me tell you now, in light even of these visions and revelations, he says, I want to tell you about my struggle that got connected to these visions and revelations that I had. So at verse 6, though if I should wish to boast, I would not be a fool, for I would be speaking the truth. 
but I refrain from it so that no man may think more of me than he sees in me or hears from me. He said, look, if I did want to talk about myself and some amazing experiences that God gave me, I wouldn't be lying. I wouldn't be a fool lying. What does God say about lies? He says lying lips are an abomination to God. So if we're a person who lies and lies and lies, if we're a person like that false prophet who lies in the name of Jesus, yeah, we are foolish, foolish, right? There will be a price to pay, right? That false prophet that Paul is talking about will have a price to pay. And so Paul says, look, if I did want to tell you about all my visions and revelations, he said, I wouldn't be a fool because I, I'm not lying. I'm speaking the truth. He says, but I refrain from doing that so that no one may think more of me than he sees in me or hears from me. He says, I don't want to tell you all the time about all these incredible things that God has, has you know, shown me or the ways he's spoken to my heart or the visions that he's given me because what I want you to think about is just what you hear me speak. I want you to think about the word of God that I speak to you. I want you to look at my life. I don't want to paint a picture for you. And again, he's contrasting himself to that false prophet who was painting this picture, talking about himself all the time. Talking about himself all the time, all his experiences, all his visions, all his revelations. You know, if you're listening to a preacher who's always talking about himself all the time, right? always talking about the incredible things that God is doing in him all the time, yeah, that's not somebody you want to listen to, right? Not somebody you want to listen to. He says, I, I don't want anyone to think more of me than he sees in me and hears from me. Evaluate the word of God that I'm speaking to you. Evaluate my life. Jesus, what did Jesus say about the false prophets? You'll know them by their fruits. And what did he mean? The fruit of a huge growing congregation? No, he meant the fruit of the spirit. You know, always interpret the scripture by the scripture. Jesus used the word fruit. You'll know them by their fruit. Then read the words of the apostle Paul about the fruit of the spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. Wow, there you go. You'll know them by their fruit. How is this person living his life? How is he living his life? He's painting a picture, but who is he really? How is he really living his life? Is the fruit of the Spirit evident in his lives? And you know, that's what we want people to see in us is the goodness of Jesus in our lives. Because when people see the goodness of Jesus, what did Jesus see? Let say, he said, uh, look, let your light shine that when people see your good works, when they see the goodness that I'm accomplishing through you, they will give glory to your Father in heaven. And so at verse 7, now Paul goes on to, why did he, okay, then why did he talk about that experience of being caught up into the third heaven? Well, now we have the explanation starting at verse 7. And this is where Paul was aiming at in this whole discussion. He says, so to keep me from becoming conceited, because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations. So to keep me from becoming conceited. So Paul has this amazing experience, right? He's, he's lifted up, lifted beyond the universe. He's lifted up into the presence of God, right? And then he's back. And he says, to keep me from becoming conceited, prideful, full of himself. Now, who wants to keep us from becoming prideful and full of ourselves. The Lord, of course. God warns us again and again and again about the danger of pride, right? And pride lays a man low. That's what the scripture says, right? That humility, the Lord lifts up those who are humble and casts down those who are pride, right? In pridefulness, we close our ears to truth. In pridefulness, we live for our self-centered purposes. So who wants to keep Paul from becoming conceited or prideful? The Lord, of course. So he says, to keep me from becoming conceited because of the surpassing revel greatness of the revelations, a thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from becoming conceited. So he says, a thorn was given me in the flesh. So Bible scholars have debated and debated what that thorn in the flesh was that Paul, it says, was, that was given to Paul. So some people think it was maybe some emotional turmoil 
going on in Paul's mind and in his heart. I think the word flesh gives us the, the clue that it was a physical affliction. We know that Paul, from reading places in his different letters, that Paul was losing his vision, he was losing his eyesight. In other words, he was going blind. We also know that he, he said, I know my appearance is a trial to you. So perhaps he had an eye disease. Think maybe of uh, persons you see uh, in a developing, very, very poor region of the world that don't have access to good medical care and sometimes the horrible uh, diseases, maybe even of the eyes that might be on someone's face and it might grow even beyond their eyes. Uh, I tend to think uh, with many Bible scholars that that thorn in the flesh was uh, 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 an eye disease that had come to Paul. So he says, to keep me from becoming conceited, a thorn was given me in the flesh. Now who would want to give him that thorn in the flesh to keep him from being prideful? That would be the Lord, right? to keep Paul from becoming full of pride. The thorn in the flesh was given him, but look what he says next, a messenger of Satan to harass me. So what does that mean? It means it was the devil who afflicted Paul with that eye disease. It was the devil who thought he could stop Paul, right, by afflicting him with this eye disease. It was the devil who, who, you know, is causing Paul to go blind, who's causing Paul to have some awful appearance on his face. But, you know, the devil's not all-powerful. God's all-powerful, right? And God is always attentive to what's going on in our lives. Could not God have stopped Satan from sending that, that, that uh, affliction to Paul? Of course, the Lord could have stopped that. But the Lord didn't stop it. The Lord didn't stop Satan, the devil, from afflicting Paul with that thorn in the flesh. God could have stopped it, but he didn't. And so, uh, and, you know, Satan's purpose, what? He says, to harass me. But what was God's purpose? Again, he says at the, at the end of that verse 7, to keep me from becoming conceited. Now, this is Paul writing this, right? He's looking back, and he's going to tell us more of the story here, which is an amazing thing, what he says. But he's looking back. He's able now to look at this horrendous thing that had happened to him, right? He's going blind, and he has this awful thing growing on his, his face, right? And we, we, you know, so Paul is like, well, hey, look, I'm, I'm traveling from place to place to place. This is getting harder and harder, and I'm standing up in front of people and sharing about Jesus. In other words, people are looking at me as I'm talking to them, and I have this awful thing on my face. It's hard to look at me. But Paul is able to interpret it now, in light of what we're going to read here in a moment, that this was God accomplishing something greater than Paul could have ever begun to imagine. You know, wow. You know, well, let, let's just go on, because this is an amazing to me, this is one of the most amazing passages of Scripture as Paul came to understand what God was doing through this affliction. So look at verse 8 now. Three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me. He says, I asked and I asked and I asked the Lord to, to heal me, to take this, this thorn in the flesh away from me. He says, I pleaded with the Lord. I begged the Lord. Lord, I'm, I'm trying to serve you. I'm trying to stand in front of crowds of people and, and preach your word. And, and, and they, they look at me and they almost they turn away because of the appearance of my face. It's not easy. And, and Lord, I'm trying to travel and this is making it harder and harder to go from place to place. And Lord, I'm trying to write all these letters and now I have to dictate these letters. I have to have someone write them to me. Lord, please heal me. Please heal me. You know, just like you and me, right? Some hardship comes to our lives, and we ask the Lord. We ask the Lord to, to change that circumstance. We ask the Lord to heal our bodies or heal a loved one. We ask the Lord to, to, to change this situation. And that's what we're told to do. Paul himself wrote that in his letter to the Philippians, right? Uh, he, he said, let all your requests be made known to God. What did he say? Have no anxiety, no worry, no fear about anything. 
but let all your requests be made known to God with thanksgiving and the peace that passes all understanding will guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. So yes, just like Paul did, he asked and he asked and yes, we are to ask the Lord. All of our requests, we ask the Lord. With gratitude, with thanksgiving, we ask the Lord. When he says here, three times I pleaded with the Lord, I'm sure it meant, uh, it did, I'm sure it didn't mean, yeah, three times in one day I asked the Lord to heal me. I'm sure it meant he had three seasons of prayer. Maybe he prayed and fasted for a week and then another time uh, for another week or maybe he had a whole month of prayer and then another time a whole month of prayer. 40 is a number that we see so often in Scripture. Maybe he had 40 days where every single day he was fasting maybe from sunup to sundown and only eating uh, after the sun went down, right? And he was fasting and pouring out his heart, right, to the Lord, asking the Lord to heal his body. What happened? Look at verse 9. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. But the Lord answered him, he, Jesus, Paul asked, right, that he would be healed, but the Lord answered him and said, no, my, I'm not going to heal you. You don't need me to heal you. My grace is sufficient for you. Grace, that freely given, unearned, undeserved love and kindness of God. That's all you need, Paul. You don't need me to heal this eye disease. You don't need me to take away this thorn in the flesh. My grace is sufficient for you. My grace is sufficient for you. If you know my grace, if you know my love for you, if you've put your faith in me, Paul, then that's all you need. You don't need anything else. You know, I can testify to what I've seen when I've traveled, for example, to our, our children's home, our orphanage that this church operates in southern Africa in Namibia, and I've gone to villages out in the bush, right, and worshiped with Christians there, or I've gone to villages and met persons who have nothing of the things of this world. I've been in their homes that are a mud hut and a dirt floor and a thatched roof and no running water, and they cook on an open fire their whole life. They have no bathroom, no running water, their whole lives, and yet those who knew Jesus, those who know Jesus, I've met persons of incredible joy. I've met persons, I met a family in Namibia near our orphanage who living just like I've just described here, and they adopted one child after another as so many people in their village were dying of uh, malaria or, or AIDS, right? And they, this family, these husband and wife who had nothing except they had Jesus, which meant they had everything. They had so much kindness and love in their hearts, they adopted. How could they afford to feed more and more children? But they did it. They had everything. So, you know, when we feel as if because of this affliction, because of this circumstance, because of this, this trouble in my life, like it's like it's destroying me, like I got nothing, here's our God saying, no, my grace is sufficient for you. It's all you need. You can have joy. You can have strength. You can be filled with peace, a peace that passes all understanding if you know my grace, if you put your faith in me. Wow. So he says to Paul, when Paul's asking, please heal me, please remove this thorn in the flesh, he says, my grace is sufficient for you. And then look what he says, for my power is made perfect in weakness. My power is made perfect in weakness. Paul, you have a weakness in your body. You have this thorn in the flesh, and it's given you a weakness in your body. But Paul, through this weakness in your body, my power is multiplied and multiplied within you. Paul, you are relying on me all the more. You will have to rely on me all the more. And as you do, your faith will grow stronger and stronger. And as your faith grows stronger and stronger, you will become stronger and stronger, and stronger, and stronger. You know, this is exactly why Jesus said, you know, it's harder for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven than it is for a, a camel to go through the eye of a needle. Why? Because those of us, all of us here in this very wealthy nation, right, we rely on our prosperity. We have more faith in our prosperity than we think, right? More than we think, and therefore our faith 
isn't as strong as we, as we would want it to be. Because more than we realize, we're relying on our prosperity. And this is exactly why in the book of James it tells us, has not God chosen those who are poor in the world to be rich in faith? Because when you have the weakness of abject poverty, right, when you don't know where your next meal is coming from, right, then wh- what, what do you have except Jesus? And if you put your faith in Jesus, your faith becomes stronger and stronger and stronger and stronger. And so here's Paul saying, or no, here's the Lord saying to Paul, Paul, I'm not going to heal you. I allowed Satan to afflict you with that thorn in the flesh because, Paul, I'm going to guard your heart from any kind of pridefulness. Remember, Paul had those revelations, those visions. Paul, I'm going to guard your heart from any kind of pridefulness because if that pridefulness creeps into your heart, if you start putting your faith in the fact that you're this man who had these visions and revelations, Paul, you're not going to be strong. Wow, can we get this in our heads with the afflictions and troubles that do come to our lives? Can we trust? Can we have this faith that our God knows what he's doing? Our God knows what he's doing. Did, did God send right that affliction to Paul? No. But did God allow the devil to do it? Yes. Right? Can we trust that our God, our God knows what he's doing? Our God's love never fails. His power never fails. Could God have stopped that devil? Yes, of course he could have. Right? But he didn't. Can we trust? And if we do, if we do learn how to trust God in our afflictions, in our troubles... Right? Now, this is not something you're going to just get and boom, you got it for the rest of your life. Right? This is something we grow and grow and grow into. Right? But if we say, Lord, give me the strength, as the disciple said, Lord, or as that man said to Jesus, increase our faith. Right? Increase my faith. Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. The disciple said, Lord, increase our, our faith. Right? Then what happens in the midst of struggles, instead of being defeated by them, instead of being destroyed by the hardships, the difficulties of life, right? We find that his power is made perfect. His power is multiplied. We get stronger and stronger and stronger. And so that's why the the rest of that, verse 9, Therefore I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. He's saying, therefore, what I'm going to think about What I'm going to talk about is not this wonderful, perfect life I wish I had or paint this false picture like that false prophet was painting of this wonderful, perfect life I have. He says, no, I'm going to, here he says, boast. I'm going to tell you about my struggles, my challenges, my weaknesses. He's saying to him, look, in this letter that I'm writing to you, I'm being very honest. I'm telling you about my struggles because I have found that in my struggles, I've become stronger and stronger and stronger. And he's saying to the congregation, this is what following Jesus is all about. What following Jesus is all about is not that Jesus will wave a magic wand and your troubles and problems will go away. You live, we all live, in a world full of trouble. So Jesus doesn't wave a magic wand and all your troubles go away. right? But... When we put our faith in him, keep our faith in him, even when he doesn't give us what we ask of him when we pray, right? Paul asked, remove this thing. And then when Paul says, no, I'm not. My grace is sufficient for you. My power will be made perfect in weakness. Paul had a choice. He had a choice. He had a decision right at that point when he realized that, when he heard that from the Lord. He had a choice. Would he say, well, then forget you? Would he cuss out God, cuss out the universe, whatever, and say, forget it? Or would he say, Lord, I trust you. I trust you that in this weakness of my flesh, in this affliction, in this thorn in the flesh, you are making me stronger and stronger and stronger. And so sometimes we get an attitude about that. Oh, great, so I have to go through all these problems just so I can get stronger. It means, what what did it mean for Paul? It meant stronger and stronger and stronger to more and more and more be able to bring the love of God to a broken, hurting world all around him, right? It it meant stronger and stronger to keep on going no matter what until his dying breath, right? 
Until that dying moment when he's no longer here but with the Lord, right, for eternity, right? I said, I, I, yes, I want to get stronger and stronger so I can keep on going, bringing the love of Jesus. There are so many hurting people all around us. People are hurting so badly. And here's the Lord saying, now trust me, and I'll give you the wisdom. I'll give you the strength. I'll give you the courage and the determination to keep being a blessing, no matter, no matter what. Wow. Yeah, instead of an attitude, oh, so I have to go through all these problems just so I can get stronger. What, think about what does that stronger mean? It means stronger to love and to love and to love, to forgive and to forgive and to forgive, to be kind and compassionate and merciful. That's the strength that the Lord gives us even through our afflictions and especially through our afflictions. And so, at verse 10, for the sake of Christ, then, I am content with weaknesses. Look at that. For the sake of Christ, for the sake of continuing to, to lift up Jesus, continuing to be a blessing, to bring the love of Jesus to broken, hurting people, to a broken, hurting, lost world. For the sake of Christ, for the sake of doing this, I am content with weaknesses. Paul's saying, I'm content with this thorn in the flesh. I'm not going to be frustrated. I'm, I'm going to choose not to be angry about it. I'm going to choose not to be defeated by it. I'm going to choose, I am choosing to be content with it because I know I'm getting stronger and stronger through it. I am content with weaknesses, insults. Now he starts this list of all the things that we read about in chapter 11, all the different problems all the problems that that false teacher was saying, look at Paul had all those problems, look at all those things happening to him, he must not really have faith. And Paul said, nope, no, that's not what it is. Yep, I have all these challenges, all these difficulties. And through them all, I am getting stronger and stronger, bringing the love of Jesus, therefore, to person after person. I'm not giving up, I'm not quitting. I'm not sinking into just living for myself like that false prophet was doing. And so he says, for the sake of Christ, then I am content with weaknesses, insults. Man, when people trash talk you, they talk behind your back, they talk to your face. What does the scripture say? Our words are like swords, right? That's a good word for us, right? About, about you know, asking the Lord to guard our lips so that our words aren't like swords into people's hearts, right? Wow, because that's what they are. Well, here's Paul saying, yeah, and when people stuck those swords into my heart with their words... He says, I'm not destroyed by it. I'm content with it. I have found the power of Christ grows in me, grows and grows in me. So he says, weaknesses, I'm content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, just the hardships of life, the hardships of living in a, in a challenging world, the hardships that, that come to our lives, even as we sacrificially give of our lives uh, to those around you. Right? This calling that Jesus puts on our life is not like you know, Disney World, right? It's not just all about for our fun and our excitement and our happiness and our peace. I can't ever stop talking about a website of a church I read one time. And on the website it said, uh, they, it was kind of like a new church start. And on the website it said, when it's no more fun, we're done. Oh, great. When it's no more fun, we're done. Well, Paul would have been done then long before, Right? He, but he, Paul kept going even when it wasn't fun. Jesus isn't like saying, okay, I'll give you a Disney World life. So Paul says, I'm content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, people doing me wrong because I have faith in Jesus, people doing me wrong because I am a person of integrity, because I am a, a, a person who, who does the right thing. I'm content with that. That's on them. It's on them. And the pain and the hurt that it brings to my life, let's just remember what, that whole long list we read in, in chapter 11, right? Paul was beaten up over and over again, right? He was thrown in jail over and over again and on and on and on. Why? Well, a big part of it was the racism of the Roman Empire. Paul, a, a Jew, a tiny minority in that Roman Empire, and because the Jews wouldn't bow down and worship the emperor or worship the kings, under the emperor, right? They were persecuted. So Paul, who's going from place to place, always talking about Jesus, 
this Israelite, this Jew who he proclaimed was the Savior, the Messiah, the God of all the earth, right? He was beaten up again and again, thrown in the jail again and again, right? Uh, and Paul says, I'm content with it. I'm content with it because every single time I got stronger. I got stronger through it. Now, were they easy? No, we read right here in this 2 Corinthians at the beginning. Remember that time he was in Ephesus and the Romans would like sometimes take all their prisoners in their jails and in the stadiums. It was for entertainment for the crowds that came. They'd put them out there in the middle, right? And then they'd release lions and leopards or the uh, soldiers with bows and arrows would be shooting at them. It was just like, you know, all the violent, horrible movies that Hollywood produces, but this was live entertainment. So that happened to Paul. He's out there looking a lion in the face, right? He said, you know, we thought we had received the sentence of death, right? He, they, they thought they were going to die. It was, it was not easy for him at all. But as Paul went through it, as Paul lived through it, we, we would use the word, the, the trauma of that moment, right? And then, remember, so they take him back to the prison, and then all these other things happen, right? But Paul said, through that all, I got stronger. And he says, therefore, I'm content with it. Now, he got stronger because he had learned how to trust God. He had learned how to trust God. He had learned, you know, through this experience, and I'm sure many others, when the Lord said to him, my grace is sufficient for you. It's all that you need. And my power is multiplied in your weakness. So he says, I'm content with persecutions and calamities, just calamities, when everything just goes wrong. Isn't that the way it seems like in life? Like just everything just seems to keep going wrong and sometimes it seems to happen all at once. Like one thing goes wrong and another thing goes wrong and another thing goes wrong. And here's the Lord. Of course, the Lord could have stopped all those things from going wrong. You have a bad day, a bad week, a bad month. Everything just keeps going wrong. A bad decade. Everything keeps going wrong. The Lord could have stopped all those things from going wrong, but he didn't. And so therefore we say, okay, Lord, Okay, Lord, I'm going to trust you. I'm going to trust you. And what does Paul say there at the end of that verse 10? For when I am weak, then I am strong. For when I am weak, when this world has beaten me down, when this world has just knocked me down, punched me in the face, when I am weak, then I am strong. Because then I remember all the more I will rely. I will put my faith not in myself. I will put my faith in Jesus. Now, you remember some of the people that Paul thought were, you know, with him ended up stabbing him in the back. And so what? When we put our faith not in people around us, when we put our faith not in ourselves, when we put our faith in Jesus, the infinitely powerful, infinitely wise, infinitely loving God, when we put our faith in Jesus, then we get strong. That is an amazing truth. When I am weak, then I am strong. Let's go on to verse 11 here. I have been a fool. You, have forced, you forced me to it, for I ought to have been commended by you. For I was not at all inferior to these super apostles, even though I am nothing. And so now Paul is kind of, kind of he's going on in the same direction here, but he says, I've been a fool. You forced me to it. I've been talking about myself. He says, I don't talk about myself, but I've had to talk about myself because this other guy is telling you all this false lies about his life, right? And he's painting a picture of the kind of things that I've endured as a picture of what shouldn't be happening to you if you have faith in Jesus. And Paul said, so I've had to tell you about it. You forced me to it. He says, for I ought to have been commended by you. He's saying, if you understood better, if you had a... Uh, uh, deeper understanding of the word of God, I wouldn't have even needed to say these things to you. But you, you forced me to it. He says, I ought to have been commended by you. You ought to have been able to look at the struggles in my life. You ought to been, have been able to, to consider that this thorn in the flesh that I have, this, this eye disease that I have, was not a sign of weakness of my faith. It was a sign of God at work in my life. He says, you ought to have been able to understand that. Wow, such amazing experiences uh, that, um, that Paul is, is sharing with them. Can we grab hold of them? 
and we say, you know what? You remember what Jesus said, many who are last will be first. Many who, who the world would say are the least and the last at the end of the line. Many who the world would say, oh, I'd never want to be that person. You know, wouldn't say it with their lips maybe, or maybe would say it with their lips. Jesus said, in fact, will be first, right? Persons who have, quote, special needs, where their mind maybe doesn't work like uh, our minds work. They're not able to speak the way we speak. Uh, they have, you know, weaknesses of the, the body. And yet, here's a God who has given such incredible faith to persons who are so weak in body, right? Even weak in mind and incredible faith. Now, come and hang out for a while with our Beyond Capernaum, our special needs ministry here. And if you hang out long enough, you'll experience this. You'll see it. You'll see it. Wow. It's amazing. So Paul says, I ought to have been commended by you. I shouldn't have even needed to have said all of this to you. And he says, for I was not at all inferior to these super apostles, even though I'm nothing. He, he used that phrase once before, this super apostle, these super apostles presenting themselves as, you know, supermen of God, right? He says, they're acting like they're so super. He says, he's saying to the church in court, now you should have been able to discern the reality here, but I have to tell you so, I told you. And, but Paul then says, I'm not at all inferior to these super apostles, even though I am nothing. Even though I am nothing. Wow. Here's Paul. Now, I'll tell you what, for me personally, my number one hero is Jesus. My number two hero is Paul, as I read his life. And here's Paul saying, even though I am nothing. Now, doesn't that just sound completely wrong? Completely wrong to us? I'm nothing. In our self-esteem society, right? With that in a world that beats us down, right? We feel like we have to say, I am something. I am something. Here's Paul saying, I'm nothing. What does he mean? I am nothing without Jesus. I'm, I, I, I don't have strength. I don't have the kind. Of, in, in other words, he's saying compared to the strength, compared to the courage, compared to the, the kind of love that he puts in my heart, the kind of compassion that he's put in my heart, he says, I'm nothing. He's saying, I'm a hot mess. I'm just a mess without him. But with him, but with him, I've got all that I need. With Jesus, I've got everything. That's what I saw when I've been in Africa. I was in, as I was telling you, I was in, in uh, Namibia where our orphanage is. I had an opportunity to go to Liberia uh, one time in West Africa, this nation that just it was coming through this horrendous, horrible civil war. Just atrocities, atrocities, and just grinding poverty. And yet when I met followers of Jesus there in Liberia, I was blown away, blown away by their faith, blown away by their kindness, blown away by the way God was at work in them and through them, right? So uh, I was there and it was really an extremely hard time for the people of Liberia. And they found out there was this small, there was five of us, this small group of Christians from America, Right, who had come to Liberia, and, and the war was really still going on, but where we were, the war wasn't right there, and we had come. And so people just came from miles. They heard these, these Christians from America were here. They literally walked for miles and miles and miles, and we were just surrounded by people all the time. And one time we were taken to a refugee camp, and people had heard we were coming, and they came, and they came, and they came. And then when we got there, I discovered I was preaching. Right? And this was, I don't know, 20, however many years ago it was, long time ago, and I was a, a new preacher at the time, and here are these people, they're just looking at us like in awe, right? And I'm looking at them, and I'm realizing I am nothing. I am nothing. I've seen the way that God was at work in their hearts, the way that God was at work in their lives. Wow. Wow. And I realized, I, that, I remember that very clearly. I am nothing, nothing at all. You know, for Paul to say, I am, I am nothing, that's a powerful word for us. Because when we begin to think that we are something, when we can begin to get full of ourselves, even though that feels like what we need because, you know, the trauma of this world, the hatred of this world uh, will beat the life out of us, 
The way to get life back in us is not, I am, I am, I am. The way to get life back in us is Jesus. Jesus in me. Jesus at work. Jesus giving me strength. Jesus giving me hope. Jesus giving me joy. Jesus giving me peace. It's not about me believing in me. It's me believing in Jesus. Me believing in Jesus in me. Now, look, you've been beaten down by life. Life has beaten you up. And here's Pastor Craig saying, no, I'm nothing. We're nothing. And it's like, Pastor Craig, I don't like what you're saying. But listen, listen to Paul here. Yeah, his, his, I mean, in ancient times, without the medicine that we might have quickly, this thing that's happening to him, and of course he's going blind, but this thing growing on his face, right? And then all these horrendous experiences that he had, all the racism coming against him, and even his, some of his friends stabbing him in the back, right? Getting beat up over and over again. And here's Paul who could say, you know what? I'm nothing. I- I'm nothing. But Jesus in me, that's everything. Jesus in me, that's my joy. That's my courage. That's my strength. Wow. This is an awesome God. This is a God who teaches us, who teaches us how to handle, how to handle the hardest things in life. Here's an, this awesome God who teaches us, right, how to live our lives surrounded by, surrounded by so much trouble in a world where we have, as Jesus said, tribulation. Here's this amazing God who teaches us how to keep courage and strength, how to gain courage, how to grab hold of courage and strength, how to get healed. I mean, Paul was beaten up physically, but emotionally again and again, but the Lord told him how to get healed from it all. Here's this amazing, amazing God who has come to our lives, who's knocked at the door of our hearts, who's called our names and says, let me in. Let me be the king of your heart, the king of your life. So we're going to stop right there at verse 11. We will start at verse 12 next week. And I'm so glad that you've joined us. Uh, All of our Bible studies are on our website mzpraise.org. Click Bible study. You'll find them there. They're on YouTube. You can find them there. They're on our Facebook page. You can find them there. I hope you'll share these. Tell folks about them. Uh, God's word is powerful. So let's pray together. Lord God, we thank you that when we are weak, we become strong. We thank you, Lord God, that even what the devil throws at us, you turn it around and we'll use it for great, great good, whatever this world throws at us, Lord God, you will turn it around. Lord God, you will teach us, you will show us how to become strong, how to become filled with joy and kindness and compassion and love. Lord Jesus, we thank you. We love you. We pray, Lord, you would open our eyes to the the false prophets, the wolves in sheep's clothing who would just teach us that which is not true. Give us false hopes that end up destroying us. Lord, open our eyes. We thank you, Jesus. We pray these things in your precious name. Amen and amen. God bless you, Mount Zion. See you soon.